Welcome back. What I'd like to do in this video is look at the classic example of Roman scattering again that we introduced a couple videos ago and talk about Stokes and anti Stokes scattering and consider why one of the aspects of the fluorescence question that was just raised. If we remember, we had the ground state and the excited state, V equals zero, V equals one, V equals two, so on and so forth. We had the laser come in, strike the molecule, raise it to a virtual state, and then, and I'm not going to worry about the Rayleigh scattering, we're going to look at Stokes and anti-Stokes. And in the case of Stokes scattering, we come back here, and we have the delta being that energy level there. And in the case of an anti-Stokes, we started from the excited state, and we come down all the way to the ground state. Now in this case, the Stokes line and the anti-Stokes line are marked here. Notice a couple of things about them. Remember, if we go back to that fluorescence video, we showed that the fluorescent photon, you had absorption followed by emission, but that emission photon was lower in energy than the laser. Lower in energy than the laser. If we look at the Stokes photon, it is also lower in energy than the laser. So in a sense, it's on the same side, so to speak, of the laser emission as is the fluorescence. On the other hand, the anti-Stokes is on the other side. The anti-Stokes is higher in energy. So if we were to plot the spectrum, and let's do that now. Let's look at what we would say is the spectrum. And as an example, I'm going to use this molecule, carbon tetrachloride. The carbon tetrachloride molecule, CCL4, which is it's basically the the polystyrene of Raman. It's the basic molecule that if you understand how that works, a lot of things make sense. And we'll, be keep, we'll keep coming back to it as we go through. Now, if we look here, this is going to be the laser frequency, nu sub L, on my plot. So what I'm plotting here is the energy going both ways, the spectrum in a, in a shifted format. So if we look at the laser frequency, and then we look at the scatter intensity in this direction. The first scatter we have is the Rayleigh scatter. Now that Rayleigh scatter is huge. And as we're going to talk about in a couple of videos when we look at the instrumentation, we have to worry about that. It's a problem because the detector looking at that scatter would be like looking at the sun. It would be so bright it could damage the detector. Now, if we consider the carbon tet molecule, it has a couple of different motions. We'll just look at three. There are the three motions, and this is on the Stokes side. So this is on the lower energy side. So we get three peaks due to different motions of the carbon tet. This big one is due to the symmetric motion of the carbon tet molecule, okay? The symmetric stretch of all the carbon chlorines. These are various other modes. If we look on the anti-Stokes side, what we would anticipate is the same thing. We would expect it to be a mirror image, because remember, the energy here would just simply be higher, but by the same increments. So whatever that energy is, is where that would be. That energy is where that would be. That energy is where that would be. And we would expect everything is good. We'd say to avoid fluorescence, let's go over here. There's one piece missing, though. And that one piece that's missing is the Boltzmann distribution. The Boltzmann distribution determines how, what the population of each one of these energy levels is. At a given temperature, the Boltzmann distribution would say more of your molecules are in the ground state than they are in the excited state. As the temperature goes up, you can populate the excited state, but that energy depends upon the spacing of the energy levels. These energy, this is a fairly low energy level. This one's a little bit higher. This one's higher still. As the energy goes up, the energy necessary from thermal excitation, 
to boost the molecule up into that excited state for the anti-stoke side becomes bigger and bigger and therefore less and less likely. And what actually happens on this side is there is an exponential decay in the intensity. So instead of looking like this, the anti-stoke side, if we redraw this, and all I'm going to do is just redraw the anti-stoke side. So there's new L again. So there's my Rayleigh line. The anti-stoke's peaks are actually going to be smaller, and they're going to continually get smaller. They're going to get exponentially smaller than the stoke side peaks. These are going to be bigger. So what's happening is, as you go out further and further onto the anti-stoke side, your intensity is dropping away, and therefore what seemed to be like a good idea of how to get rid of fluorescence turns out not to be so good. Anti-stoke side intensities are generally lower. There are specialty techniques like what's called CARS, coherent anti-stokes Roman spectroscopy, where you do things, but that requires multiple lasers, you actually have to pump the energy into the energy levels, etc. We're not talking about that. We're just talking about spontaneous Raman. So if you just had a system with carbon tetrachloride molecules in it, what you'd see is the Stokes peaks, one, two, three, there's more, but those are the big three. In the anti-Stokes side, you would see them, but they're going to be much lower in intensity. So you'd be fighting, as you go over to that anti-Stokes side, you're actually fighting the Boltzmann distribution and you're not going to win. Even if you raise the temperature, at some point you just boil off the carbon tet, you're not really going to help this situation. So this is why Stokes spectroscopy is almost the only one ever done. As we'll see later when we talk about the instrumentation, there are filters which allow us to eliminate the laser and there are mainly two kinds. One of them eliminates just the laser. That's called a notch filter, and it's quite expensive. On the other hand, there's something called uh, a bandpass filter, which would eliminate it, but also eliminates the anti-stoke side. Those filters are a lot cheaper, and because the level of information on the anti-stoke side is so much reduced by this Boltzmann factor, those are the filters many uh, vendors will choose to use because there's not there's not useful information. Um, well, the information's there. I'm just saying the intensity is so much lower that it's not worth the fight to get it. Okay, so that's a brief look at the Stokes, Anti Stokes, and the Boltzmann distribution. We'll next talk about the lasers. We'll look at how we avoid fluorescence in other ways. Like I said, this would be an obvious way to do it because since this is higher in energy than the laser, the fluorescence would be over here. It's not going to be over there. It just doesn't work very well because of this Boltzmann factor. Uh, I always call it Bradley's first rule of spectroscopy. You never get something for nothing. You think you could get over here and get it, but there's a price to be paid, and that price is intensity. Okay, so now let's move on.